Hello, this is Lindsay Clark, your primary instructor for molecular diagnostics. So this lecture today, we are going to talk about nucleic acid extraction and quantitation. So when we talk about nucleic acids, remember this can be DNA or RNA. So we're going to touch on extraction techniques for both of these. And then we're going to discuss how to quantitate the extracted nucleic acid. And the objectives for today's lecture are number one, list reasons for extracting nucleic acids. Number two, compare DNA and RNA with respect to their relative stability and extraction protocols. Number three, briefly outline the basic laboratory procedure for extracting nucleic acids, including standard precautions, use of aerosol resistant tips, centrifugation, vortexing, and specimen processing. Number four, briefly outline liquid phase and solid phase extraction procedures. Number five, summarize factors which interfere with nucleic acid extraction, such as RNase and freeze-thaw cycles. Number six, determine and evaluate the purity of a nucleic acid preparation. And number seven, calculate nucleic acid yield for RNA and DNA preparations. Now you may be wondering why one would need to extract DNA or RNA. What can we even use that for? So DNA and RNA can actually be used in many different ways, such as for genetic testing, cancer characterization. It can be used to identify humans in forensic cases, to detect infectious organisms, um, and that's just to name a few. And on top of that, we can extract nucleic acids from many different specimens, and that includes body fluids, buccal swabs, tissues, and even cultured microorganisms. So this makes molecular diagnostic testing very versatile, and I can guarantee you we will see more molecular testing in the future. And we know there are differences in DNA and RNA, and that also means there will be differences in the extraction techniques. DNA is relatively stable, but it does exist in long, thin strands, which can be prone to shearing. So it's important to avoid excessive or rough pipetting or vortexing in order to preserve the DNA. RNA, on the other hand, is small, fairly unstable, and easily degraded. Remember that DNases degrade DNA? Well, RNases degrade RNA, and RNases are everywhere. So RNA extraction requires extra care. However, sometimes it is necessary, and that can mean in the case of testing for things like RNA viruses, so HIV or HCV, or even testing for expressed gene detection. Basic laboratory procedures for extracting nucleic acids include using a standard precaution, of course. And for mo most molecular procedures, a lab coat and gloves are sufficient, but sometimes extra PPE is required. Maybe you require shoe covers in the room that you're working in um, or eye protection. For most molecular procedures, you're going to use aerosol resistant tips. Um, these are commonly referred to as art tips, and you'll use those for pipetting. These tips have a small filter near the top, and that helps prevent aerosols while pipetting. And why do we care about preventing aerosols in the molecular lab? Well, because that's a huge source of contamination. Also, you will hear things in the molecular lab like pulse spin. And this means you centrifuge your specimens in short bursts. The reason for this is to make sure all the liquid is at the bottom of the tube so your gloves are not contaminated when opening the tube. We also want to vortex our specimens carefully. Remember, we want to avoid shearing of our DNA. When we are extracting DNA, there are three basic steps. So first, we lyse the cells to get the DNA out of the nucleus. Then, we digest the trash proteins that we don't want. And last, we purify the DNA. And we can extract DNA using liquid phase methods or solid phase methods. And we're going to talk about those next. The liquid phase extraction method is not frequently used in clinical labs. 
And this method involves essentially layering liquids and precipitating out the DNA. One liquid phase method is the phenol chloroform method, and that's what is in the diagram here on the left. And as you can see, the cells are lysed with lysis buffer, and the proteins are then digested with proteinase K. Then a phenol chloroform mixture is added to separate out the proteins and the DNA. Next, the DNA is transferred to a new tube and precipitated with alcohol. And the picture to the right shows a DNA precipitation. So if you look for that white kind of thready stuff, that's your DNA precipitate. Now, if any of you have done um, genes in a bottle where you extract your own DNA from cheek cells, or maybe um, in school you extracted DNA from a strawberry or banana, um, that was likely a different type of liquid phase extraction, but that's kind of similar to this. Now, you do not need to memorize a procedure for the phenol chloroform method. I just want you to know that it is a liquid phase method for extraction, and it basically works by using liquids to separate and precipitate out that DNA. Now, solid phase extraction methods are more common in the clinical lab. So a couple common types of solid phase extraction methods that you might see include the silica spin column method and the magnetic bead method. In the silica spin column method, your cells are lysed and then the DNA is bound to the spin column filter. And the trash proteins are washed out using buffers that don't disturb the bound DNA. And once all that debris is washed out, the DNA is then eluded out of the filter and collected in a clean tube. And you end up with pure genomic or viral DNA. Now the magnetic bead method is similar to the spin column method, except the DNA is bound to magnetic beads instead of that spin column. And once the debris has been washed away, a magnet is actually used to separate the DNA from the beads and the pure DNA is then transferred to a clean tube. So in both of these methods there is a solid something that the DNA is binding to during the wash steps. And so remember these are both solid phase and I want you to be able to tell me if I asked you what solid phase methods um, are, um, some examples, I want you to be able to tell me these. Now, as I mentioned before, solid phase extraction is more common in the clinical lab. And this is because it has advantages over liquid phase. Solid phase is faster and safer than liquid phase, especially liquid phase methods that use chloroform. A solid phase also tends to yield very clean DNA and it can yield an average of six micrograms of DNA from 200 micrograms of whole blood. Some RNA can also be extracted using this method, although if you were to do that, you would need to take extra precautions. Now, speaking of RNA extraction, it is more difficult than DNA extraction because RNA, remember, is easily degraded by RNases, which are everywhere. So when extracting RNA, you have to make sure the specimens are processed quickly or that they are properly preserved or frozen. Now, RNA extraction also requires RNase-free components like RNase-free reagents, RNase-free water, RNase-free plasticware, and certainly requires per properly decontaminated surfaces. So once we have extracted our DNA or RNA, we need to measure it to determine the purity and quantity. Now we measure the extracted specimen with a UV spectrophotometer and the two instruments pictured here are both spectrophotometers so you can see they kind of vary in um, fanciness if you will. Nucleic acids absorb UV light at 260 nm also written as A260 or OD260 the A260 stands for absorbance. The OD stands for optical density. Now proteins absorb UV light at 280 nm or A280 or OD280. 
When we place our extracted sample in the UV spec, we will get a 260 reading and a 280 reading. We can then take the ratio of these readings to determine the purity of our sample. So to get the ratio, we simply divide the OD260 by the OD280. A ratio of 1.8 to 2 tells us we have a very clean nucleic acid preparation. A sample that falls in this range is acceptable for any molecular testing. Now if our sample ratio is between 1.6 and 1.8, it is acceptable for some molecular testing like PCR, but not all molecular testing. It would not be acceptable for sequencing, for example. And if our sample ratio is less than 1.6, it is not a good extraction and basically we need to start over. A couple notes about calculations for quantity. Um, we will move on to examples after this, which will be a separate um, presentation. So when we measure OD units, which are the same as absorbents, we know that one OD unit is equal to 50 micrograms per milliliter of double-stranded DNA. Since we know this, we can calculate how much DNA per milliliter we have based on the OD reading. For example, if we have an OD reading of three units, we know we have 150 micrograms per milliliter of DNA. We simply have to multiply the OD reading by 50. Now for RNA, we know that one OD unit is equal to 40 micrograms per milliliter of RNA. So we would multiply our OD reading by 40. To calculate the yield, or how much DNA we have in our extraction, we first calculate the concentration by multiplying our OD reading by 50, and then you would multiply by the dilution factor if there is one. Then we convert that concentration from micrograms per milliliter to micrograms per microliter by dividing by 1,000 and multiplying the total volume of our sample. Now I've put together a short presentation with examples of these calculations, so please look for that to see in more detail how to determine purity and how to calculate concentration and yield of DNA extraction. So we will walk through some of those examples. Um, I want you guys to be able to, to determine purity if I were to ask you what is the yield, what is the concentration. Um, I want you to know how to determine those as well. So please watch that presentation. And if you have any questions on the information in this presentation, please, please, please let me know.